that pounding is for you. You realize that? <laughs> okay. I think, um, I think we're on opposite sides, but we'll we'll just let this one fly. Um, so you know, and they were pounding not just for the fact that you are the only the third woman in history to win a, a Nobel Lo a Prize in Physics, but also the fact that you are Canadian. You were showing me earlier your iron ring. Tell us what that means. Uh, this is a symbol that you do graduate from a Canadian engineering school. So even though I got the physics prize, I actually don't have a physics degree. But that's but the fact is that when you see other you, when you see other people with that iron ring, I know like, I know they're Canadian. You know right away. And I know they're an you engineer. Were, you were telling me some some exciting inner you know uh, some interactions with other other scientists where they were noticing this and saying, oh my God, you're also Canadian. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And you want me to tell that story again? If only if you want. <laughs> I, it, was a, it was a nice story. I, I have talked a lot in the press about how uh, I got interested in working with Gerard's lasers because of the red and the green and the light the Christmas tree. But the reason that I even met Gerard, uh, Gerard Maru, Maru. Who is the, my co-inventor yeah, okay. and, and co-winner, uh, uh, is because my very first week in Rochester, New York, where I went to grad school at the Institute of Optics, so my PhD is in optics, which is the study of light. Now a lot of people use the word photonics because the electrical people started electronics, so we had to have a cool word too. So, um, but it's still the Institute of Optics. And just my very first week there, this uh, other fellow Canadian saw my iron ring and he was running over to me and says, I heard there was gonna be another Canadian down here. And he asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I really want to work with lasers. And so he's the one who he, the very next day took me to the laser lab, the laboratory for laser energetics, and showed me the labs and introduced me to Gerard Maru. And then the last time I ha was physically with Gerard, uh, he said, you know, I just ran into Bedros, the man's name, and he said, you know what he said to me? He said, over my whole career looking back, I think the best thing I ever did for science was introduce Donna Strickland to Gerard Maru. So I thought that was very sweet. That's wonderful. So, so being Canadian not is not only um, is something that helped launch your career, but gave you a Nobel Prize. There you go. <laughs> so, um, and you, you were going to talk a little bit about this, the science that led to this. I read the 1985 paper and tried to see if I understood it in the green room with you. I think you would be better off explaining this. Okay, so I brought a couple of little demonstrations to try to explain the difference between regular lasers and uh, high intensity lasers. So I brought a regular laser that we can all get at the dollar store now. And so this is a milliwatt uh, laser. So a milliwatt is eye safe. You can see it doesn't hurt at all, all right? But I can well, turn this. You're not looking this... at it. Huh? <laughs> I said you're not looking at it, so of course it doesn't hurt, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. no, but even in your eye, it wouldn't oh, hurt. Yeah. Okay. okay, gotcha. So uh, this one's maybe losing its battery, too, so it's a little weaker. But the point is, is that a milliwatt is one thousandth of a watt, and regular light bulbs are 100 watts. These are much brighter than 100 watts. And yet you can still see the red beam, you know, or if you're using this as a cat toy, right? You can see the beam, even though it's much less power, and that's because it's all in one beam. That's what a laser does for you, all right? But this laser in the third dimension, the length is the same as time, and so it goes on forever. And so if this was a glass ceiling, not the proverbial glass ceiling, but a glass ceiling, and I sh shone my light up there, oh, you can, I can see it now, um, and, he shy, and I went all the way to the moon, and I turned it into a one-second pulsed laser. I could do that by doing this, opening my hand for a second, and shutting it again. Now, the, the front end of that pulse would be two-thirds of the way to the moon by the time I shut it off again. So a one-second long laser pulse is the length of two-thirds of the distance between here and the moon. Wow. All right, so the, the, the energy then in that one-second pulse would be a millijoule or a thousandth of a joule. That is the very same energy that I, the paper is about. It is the same energy that is used to cut uh, the cornea of your eyeball if you have LASIK surgery, it is the same energy that is used if you're going to cut the glass objects in your smartphone. So, and yet it's amazing that that much energy doesn't hurt mm. when it's over a second. But what uh, my research did was instead of all the energy being in one second or two thirds of the distance to the moon, it is in the uh, width of this paper. Mm. So that's why it's all the energy is collapsed in time as well. So then what that does and why it works for surgery 
if you think about it, is that it's, I'm going to, instead of talking about the light particles, known as photons, it really is the density of the light in the volume. But to understand it from water point of view, since we all can feel water, if you imagine being in the shower with the steam and you just grab some, a handful of steam and throw it at your face, you wouldn't feel anything really. But if you go to the sink and grab a handful of water and throw it at your face, it should feel nice, you know, <laughs> but you feel it. But if you actually went and put that in your freezer and made an uh, ice ball uh -huh. and you threw it at your face, you wouldn't because it would hurt, okay? <laughs> and so that's the point of the laser pulses that we were trying to make is that we wanted to smack the electrons right off the atoms. That's the point. Mm. So a regular laser heats you up just like the sun heats you up. And that just converts the light energy to heat, which is motion. So there are great videos out there. So if you increase the power by a million, you have the kind of laser that would cut steel. And it cuts it very fast. So you don't put that at your hand. Um, but thermal energy means that everything starts moving. And so, the, so if you start moving, the neighbor gets knocked. And that neighbor knocks the next. And that's how heat spreads. And so it's a thermal process. And so if you want to make tiny, tiny holes, it's a problem because it sort of bleeds out. By smacking it, it is uh, like, like an ice ball hitting you, and the damage only happens where the snowball hits. So I just brought one more demo, and then I'm done talking science. It's that here's my laser pulse, and the dimension in time or distance through the beam is this. But then we also use lenses to take the beam that would be like that and focus it down to a point. So now why it works for your eyeball lens or why it works for glass is that at the beginning up here, if, if I had a piece of glass that was this big and I started my pulse here, it would have a great big diameter and so the density is still like, like the steam. By down here it's like the water. But by the time it's focused in two dimensions to a point and only this, we're now down to just uh, microns, which is a thousandth of a millimeter, or the size of the human hair in all three dimensions, and now we've got all the light right there. Mm. So that's why it doesn't hurt the surface of the glass at all, and this is the first time then we could cut, not like when you cut steel, you cut right from, always you have to cut a hole through, we can now cut the hole down inside the glass, or inside the cornea, and so if you do have the LASIK surgery, it is not the one that changes the shape, it's just the one that cuts a flat by doing this, raster scat, and instead of using a scalpel, yeah. you've cut it. It's amazing. I mean, you took a pulse of light, you lengthened it, then you amplified that, then you compressed that into a tiny point. That's right. Um, it's extraordinary how uh, long it takes for this kind of science to find its application. You know, we have a very sort of short horizon when we think about research and development, and particularly in basic science. How long did it take before the first ideas were put to paper to between the first uses? Well, again, this is just sort of one piece of the puzzle, so you have to remember yeah. that. It is Albert Einstein that's, that had the first equations mm -hmm. that said that a laser would work. He's the one who understood stimulated emission, because Einstein seemed to understand everything. So that was 1917. It took to 1960 to get a laser. Mm -hmm. uh, the laser started to get to be shorter pulses the very next year. So there was a bit of a curve, and then it slowed down. And so when Jaramu gives the talk, he will show that it was slowed down until 1985 when CPA was invented, and then it's been taking CPA off ever since. Chirp, chirped pulse, pulse amplification. amplification. Yes. Okay, good. CPA, because in this room, CPA probably means something else. Yes, that's why yeah. I fought against that as being the acronym, because people would think it's certified it's, public accountant. But, uh, okay. but we tried every other combination, and nothing else worked. So you know, one of the challenges we, we've been talking about here is diversity in the workplace, diversity in academia is, is a part of that. And you know, out of the 844 people that have won Nobel Prizes, le fewer than 50 are women. In science, it's actually 20. Uh, you're one of those 20, um, which is extraordinary. But even at the academic level, um, in your department at the University of Waterloo, and you've got all these full professors there, but it, at, in the physics and astronomy department, there are seven, six women, seven women out of 42. It's, it's harder for women to get into these positions in some cases because of why? 
Well, I do think it's changing, all right? So I was the first full-time uh, female professor in physics. We had a half-time uh, woman in astrophysics there, and she had a fight to get the job. She brought her own money to start with hmm. because her husband was working at McMaster, and you do try to live with your husband. And I was always saying, uh, most female scientists are married to scientists just because it's so easy to find a man. Um, <laughs> So that'll go away if we get 50-50. <laughs> uh, we'll have to leave the lab to find them. Um, and so, you know, she was there trying to be with her husband, and so she got her own funding, and eventually, you know, she made a case for why they should hire her to stay on at Waterloo. So I was the first one, and it was a hilarious story when they, um, and so I know how few women they actually interviewed because uh, we'd go for lunch, and Gretchen uh, Harris was on the committee to, to help hire me as the one woman. And uh, another colleague said, here, I'll you know, come with me and we'll take the coat into the coat room at the university club. And Gretchen said, no, she's not gonna follow you. She's gonna follow me. And he's, they had this whole argument. <laughs> and when I finally followed Gretchen, which I could tell that's what I was supposed to do, then I realized it was the woman's room. And when John comes out, he goes, oh, it's a good thing you didn't follow me. I never noticed it's the men's room. And so I went, boy, you've obviously <laughs> brought a lot of women here before. Um, but now, since then, I've, you know, I was the head of the optics uh, hiring ever since I've been hired. And so I actually brought Melanie Campbell over from optometry. I, mm -hmm. you know, I convinced her to join us. And we brought in um, Dita Besheva. And now we've had Zo Zoya, and we've had two more in the Institute of Quantum Computing. So really, it's now like almost every year we're, we're bringing on another female. And, and do you see this happening at academic institutions uh, around Canada, around the United States? I mean, it seems like it's still a huge gap between the number of men in, in, this, in basic science and women. Well, it's, it's true, but I mean, we still only have less than 30% women, mm -hmm. even as undergraduates. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, so it's very hard also then to, to get too far along and getting more than that. We're up to, in Canada, because I was uh, the Director of Academic Affairs for the Canadian Association of Physicists, so I had to look after this data. It is about 17% women uh, right across Canada mm -hmm. now, and that's probably what it is in the United States, I would guess. But there are initiatives. The American Physical Society did come to visit us a few years ago. We asked them to come and visit us to say, what are we not doing correctly? And, what part, can we do? and part of that is starting earlier. Like we talked to, about my daughter as a, uh, a woman who's the physics teacher in her class. You talked about your own daughter's experience with that. Um, you know, you said that the teacher sort of didn't make it interesting. Um, and you were going to, I'm going to go in and teach this class. Well, she, she sort of told the class she didn't really like physics herself. And so when she said that, I thought, mm, Hannah, I've got to go in. My daughter loved that I went in in grade four, five, and six. But this was grade eight, awkward age for all of us, right? And she goes, Mom, it'll be embarrassing if you come into the class. And I went, mm, no. Now, we're going to introduce Newton's laws by, by somebody who loves Newton's laws. So uh, I went in. I don't know that I changed any minds in the grade eight Well, class, you changed her mind. She became a physicist. She, right? she is a physicist. She's well, a she's physicist. in graduate school here at Toronto in astrophysics. Well, um, so there is one other predecessor of yours who's not only won the Nobel Prize in physics, but her daughter also won. And then people say that. You know, Marie Curie's daughter, also one, Irene Curie, and I've, I'm thinking people have said to Hannah, well, now you have a role that's, model, I, and I'm going, exactly. let's put some pressure on the girl. No. <laughs> you grew up uh, less than 100 kilometers from here in the yes. town of Guelph. 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 Mm -hmm. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Guelph? Okay. Mm -hmm. it does. It is the Guelphites. It's the a Romeo and Juliet story. It's apparently the Guelphites, really. What, uh, what's it like to sort of win a, a Nobel uh, Prize for, for Canada? Being a well, first of all, it's just been very exciting for me. I mean, every friend I think I've ever had in my life has reached out to me. Uh, supposedly, my elementary school, Victory Public, uh, is going to celebrate its 100th uh, anniversary, so they've asked for mementos and if I have my report card. And my <laughs> mother was a teacher, so she's kept all my report cards, so I will give them one of my report cards from Victory right. uh, Public School. But uh, the Guelph Collegiate Vocational Institute... You didn't keep Institute, a calendar from your high school years, did you? No. Okay, good, okay. 
Uh, <laughs> well, if you get your if you get your report card, uh, that will be a great memento. Donna Strickland, Nobel laureate in physics. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I take my prize.